Welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Tim Folter. I'm uh, STR Division Chair this year. Uh, I'm happy to welcome you to our latest uh, virtual symposium. Uh, we try to have one for each of our eight research tracks, and, and, uh, and this one is on the uh, strategic leadership, uh, TMT, and corporate governance. Um, I'm sorry, we're, we're in March, aren't we? This is organizational structure, networks and relational strategies. Next, next month is uh, the strategic leadership one. This is an outstanding panel we have here of, of speakers. This is on the next frontier, the interplay of organizational structure and relational strategies. Uh, and uh, we have presenters Deepak Samaya, uh, who will be presenting a paper with John Maudsley. Uh, we have Xavier Martin, uh, who is going to present with uh, Mario Chauvin. Uh, and we have Denny Kim, who's got a soul paper, and Navid Askari uh, presenting a paper with Vivek Tandon, Ram Ranganathan, and Deepak Nayak. Uh, and discussants uh, Nandini uh, uh, Rajagopalan and Julia Bodner. So, uh, a great group on a very interesting topic. So welcome everybody uh, and hope you enjoy the session. All right, so can I share the screen now? Yes, please go ahead. So do you see the fullest slide? Yes. Okay, so uh, hi everyone, good morning. Good afternoon and good evening, depending on where you are. Thanks for joining Gwen, me, and our presenters and discussants. Before I start, I would like to acknowledge the SDR and AUM's help for providing the Division's Research Committee members uh, with uh, this opportunity, the platform. Uh, Paolo, Miros, Christopher, and Aldona also provided support, so I thank all of them. Today's symposium is titled The Next Frontier, the Interplay of Organizational Structure and Relational Strategies. But why do I think that research on relational strategies would benefit from thinking about organizational structure? So I would like to start with a story. In early 2000s, IBM had partnerships with several firms, including Sony and Microsoft. With Sony, IBM was co-developing a cell microarchitecture for PlayStation 3's processor. Subsequently, Microsoft was trying to work with IBM for design of a microprocessor for Xbox game console. A design team member recalled that IBM was concerned about possible conflicts and instability due to competition between Sony and Microsoft and commented that the initial reaction was it sort of felt like a betrayal. Hey, we have been designing this really cool chip and now you want us to do Xbox 360 thing on the same time frame, Seems like we are aiding a Sony's competitor here. So when I read this story that was also covered several years ago by the Wall Street Journal, I thought, about, uh, I thought that IBM had a structural issues. After all, it is not uncommon for firms uh, to, uh, to work with other firms that compete with one another. However, IBM could have managed this relationship by better organizational design and managing flow of knowledge within its boundaries. As demonstrated by research and supported by anecdotal evidence, cooperative strategies often involve coordinating resource sharing with partners who have divergent and con conflicting interests. Further organizational structure can shape the cost of such coordination. Therefore, I believe that our understanding of cooperative strategies from both a normative and a positive point of view will significantly improve if we take organizational structure into account. But unfortunately, the issue is understudied and the two lines of literature are not well connected, despite some emerging interest. An exception is a recent paper by Cabral, Deng, and Kumar in Journal of Management Studies that examined internal resource allocation and external activity of diversified firms. And sorry if I'm missing some other papers. Gwen and I hope that today's symposium can encourage the audience to address the shortcomings. So um, Gwen and I are the organizers. We have two great discussants who kindly um, agreed to help us, Nandini and Yulia. 
from University of Southern California and INSEAD. And then we have four great papers as uh, Tim mentioned. So uh, maybe I should hand it over to the first presenter now. Okay, so while we have participants, um, I would like to take a quick snapshot uh, just uh, to document, uh, you know, the excitement and then to do that for STR promotion. So if you will, uh, bear with me just for a second. And for those of you who are just joining us, if you are able to uh, turn on your video so I can make the background more colorful um, for the communications. So one, two, three, hang on, just one more shot. Yay. It's great to have so many pages that I can work with. Okay, you, we are done with the, the snapshots. Um, I would like to invite the first presenter to share the screen, please. Thank you, Gwen, and thank you, Navid, for putting this together. I'm delighted to be here to be presenting this paper. Um, I think this paper is perhaps more far along than most of the others in this panel. It's uh, right now forthcoming at uh, Organization Science. Uh, but I'm particularly delighted to present this because I think there's some key theoretical ideas in here that uh, I'm hoping that others will find useful. Uh, especially as you think about business growth and as you think about interorganizational relationships. Uh, the paper is co-authored with John Maudsley, who is a former PhD student at Illinois, but now uh, an assistant professor at HEC Paris. I think John's on, on the call as well. Um, uh, I was his advisor, so I can give you a little bit of a background of how this paper came about. Uh, and I do that largely because it also helps to clarify what the paper is about, right? So I think uh, it's useful to uh, have the right lens when thinking about this paper. So uh, a few years back when uh, both John and I were younger, uh, John came by and he was interested in doing a dissertation on uh, firm client relationships. More broadly, you could think about this as buyer supplier relationships. Uh, but he was thinking about this in the context of business services, particularly loss, legal services. And so he was thinking in that context, uh, but what he was interested in uh, was not individual dyadic relationships, but thinking about the bigger picture of, you know, there's there's often, and this was an, a, a very useful observation to keep in your mind, is that firms vary in the degree to which uh, they are relationally embedded with their clients. So if you take the example of law firms, some law firms have a lot of very close relationships with clients, and we are really uh, operationalizing this, thinking about the the uh, the, the length of time uh, that they've associated with the same clients, that they've gotten business from the same clients. And so the, the thing that John was interested in, uh, which is also what this paper is about, is the degree to which firms have these close relationships with their portfolio of clients. So we're thinking about this at the firm level in terms of a portfolio of relationships, not individual dyadic relationships. Uh, so that's a key thing to keep in mind. Uh, and then the question that came about and uh, was how, do this, how does this degree of relationalism or the extent of relational embeddedness of firms with their buyers, uh, how does this affect growth? Uh, and so this paper's gone through a few generations uh, subsequent to sort of completing his dissertation. Uh, John brought me aboard on this paper as well. Uh, and uh, the current version is, is as, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the most recent and the one that's headed for publication. So let's think about business growth uh, first. And uh, I think most of our understanding of business growth uh, stems from, from Penrose and, and her seminal work. 
Uh, and I'm going to paint a little bit of a straw man here of, of Penrose's sort of theory, at least how we receive and think about it. Uh, I'll present a couple of caveats as well, but it helps to illustrate, and I emphasize this is a little bit of a straw man. Um, it helps to emphasize the difference uh, with what we're doing in this paper and, and how we're trying to contribute uh, to our understanding of growth. So our usual understanding is that this is a firm, uh, and, and that firm is sort of embedded within an environment, right? And uh, of course, if you think about where growth comes from, uh, the Penrosean version is to think about resources, right? And to think about resources and uh, managerial resources as well as resources more generally. Uh, and then, of course, these resources can be applied towards potential opportunities in the environment. And you can imagine those opportunities as growing. Uh, and, and that's sort of potentially a, a source of growth. Uh, but what Penrose really emphasizes is the availability of Slack, right? So if you have Slack and the resources, then you have the ability to address these external opportunities uh, and you can grow the firm. Now, as I said, uh, that's a little bit of a straw man because uh, Penrose does emphasize uh, the idea that the managers inside the firm do engage in subjective evaluation of these external opportunities. And also there is the general sense that these resources somehow uh, need to be matched with the opportunities and therefore certainly the resource profile of firms affects the direction in which they might grow. Okay, so uh, what are we adding to this and how are we thinking about this somewhat differently? So this one idea that I'd like you to take away from this, and I, you know, we have short presentations, so I'm going to really focus on this one uh, key contribution and hopefully you can uh, build on that in your own research in some way, is this idea of the breadth of added value opportunities, right? We have abbreviated this here uh, as Bravo. It's not a, a abbreviation that we use in the paper, um, but just I thought that a, a mnemonic to remember it might be easier. Um, and then in, in a few minutes, we'll uh, I'll drop a copy of the paper in the chat as well, in case you want to take a look at it uh, in more detail. So the key thing here is that when we think about these opportunities that exist in the environment, and of course, when we think about opportunity here, we're really thinking about demand opportunities, right? So there's an element of this paper that's a demand side um, uh, a demand side contribution and a demand side paper. So uh, think about these round circles here as sort of clients, buyers in the environment that have some business to offer, right? And they it might be business that the uh, that the firm is able to get or maybe not, uh, and sort of the size of the circles here just to give you some sort of way of thinking about this is, is the extent of the demand for each of these uh, each of these buyers or clients. Now, what is it that would enable the firm to be able to, uh, in a sense, capture this demand, right? How can, how can you say something about whether the firm's able to, uh, to get this business? Uh, and that inherently should be one part of how we think about growth, right? You can augment resources all you like, but if you're not able to capture demand, uh, then those resources aren't really being put to good use. Uh, and for this, we borrow uh, language from uh, the cooperative game theory sort of inspired work on, on added value. Uh, and the idea of added value is that this is this excess value. And in this case, it's a dyadic coalition, but you could apply this more generally to any coalition. Uh, so each of these, uh, the firm in a combination with one of the buyers, you could think of as a coalition, right? It's the excess value that that coalition creates um, relative to the next best. Right. So if these various buyers for their particular needs could form a coalition with a different firm, with a different seller of services that creates more value than our focal firm, then they're unlikely to come to our focal firm to, to provide that business. Right. So instead, they would go to these other firms. And what matters for growth uh, is not just the value created with any given buyer, but the value, the, the total volume of these uh, uh, of these buyer uh, buyer side opportunities or demand side opportunities for which the firm can create added value. So the larger that volume and therefore breadth, the larger that volume of opportunities uh, for added value, uh, the higher will be the potential growth. Uh, and that's sort of the key theoretical mechanism uh, that we focus on in this paper. And of course, one of the things that we're interested in is this idea of relational embeddedness. So the attribute of the firm that we're interested in, in terms of what drives 
the potential for Bravo, to use our acronym, uh, is the, the nature of the relationships between the firm uh, and its buyers. So they may have close ties with, with some buyers, uh, which as I said earlier, sort of operationalized by the length of time that they've had these ties. There may be some weaker ties with some other buyers, and there may even be some buyers with which the firm does not have any relationship, or at least no recent relationship, right? For a long time, they've essentially not had any uh, buyer supplier relationship with them. So, uh, you know, this is perhaps something like an average firm. Uh, there are a few, uh, few buyers with whom they have very close ties, uh, a few with whom they have weak ties. There may be other firms that have very strong ties with, uh, with their buyers, and there may even be some that have very weak ties with their entire portfolio of buyers. Uh, so we're looking at that sort of uh, firm level, uh, portfolio level uh, extent of embeddedness and how that drives uh, Bravo and then in turn uh, drives growth. And so uh, we have a, a, a base sort of uh, theoretical interest, which is how does relational embeddedness uh, affect growth. Uh, but then we're also going to look at a set of moderating variables. And the moderating variables is where all the action is, because if you think about the, uh, the think about relational embeddedness itself, uh, it's not clear that it should drive the relationship in one way or the other. So on the one hand, being very closely embedded with uh, your, your clients might give you a better opportunity to add value to the business from that client. But at the same time, it might also sort of make you more narrow in some ways. So it might exclude other opportunities uh, that might be available. Even some opportunities with the same client might be actually precluded uh, by being too closely tied uh, with the focal client. So we have no prediction there but then we also we, we do have predictions about how being relationally embedded with your clients can help you um, either grow or may actually hurt you in terms of growth uh, under particular moderating conditions. So the, the two moderating conditions that are sort of complementary, if you will, with relational embeddedness uh, are cross-servicing ability and the relational commitment from the buyer side. And in this case, we operationalize that as the extent of the buyer's um, outsourcing portfolio that they outsource to that focal firm. So on average, are your buyers much more dependent on you as a supplier? Uh, and you can see how both of those things might be complementary with relational embeddedness. The greater the relational embeddedness, the more your cross-servicing ability might help you grow your business. Uh, and similarly, the buyer's relational commitment also help you grow the, grow the business. So. Um, by contrast, uh, if your buyers engage in more concurrent sourcing, meaning they have, uh, and in many of these types of services, buyers often uh, have an internal department that can handle some of this work, right? So in legal services or strategic consulting or IT services, you know, they have internal people as well who can do the same work. And to the, the, the greater the extent to which buyers do this, uh, the being relationally embedded with them uh, turns out not to help you as much. Um, one of the advantages of being relationally embedded, of course, is that you know your client better. Uh, but uh, if, uh, if you're sort of uh, developing too much knowledge that's very specific to one client, uh, then that again constrains uh, your growth outside of that client and even outside of that specific domain in which you're servicing uh, that client. So uh, our, our predictions are for two positive moderating effects and two negative moderating effects. Uh, and our findings are, are uh, first of all, that uh, relational embeddedness, at least in our context, uh, seems to actually decrease growth. It seems that it constrains firms from being able to have uh, access to a broader set of value adding opportunities. Uh, and then the rest of the hypothesis are as we predicted in the same direction as we predicted. Some of them are more strongly supported than others. Uh, particularly the buyer-specific knowledge one is a slightly weak um, statistical um, statistical effect, at least in some of our models. So um, before I go on to conclude, uh, I think it might be useful for you. I'm not going to get into the empirics in any great depth, but I wanted to give you some, a little bit of a sense of what the empirics look like. Uh, we're looking at uh, U.S. patent legal services from 1990 to 2000, uh, and uh, the dyadic buyer supply relationships here, right? firms that are outsourcing their patent prosecution work uh, to law firms. And law firms are the focal 
uh, firms in our in our model or in our uh, analysis. Uh, and so we're aggregating the attributes of these firm client relationships to the firm level. Uh, there are 225 law firms that we look at, um, 1726 observations after truncation. Uh, and the data really come from over half a million patents. Uh, and there are about more than 50,000 client relationships here that are uh, or actually clients, uh, individual clients that we're looking at to, to get these very fine grained measures uh, of the key variables. We, uh, we use a very standard um, panel log growth model, both firm and year fixed effects, uh, robust standard errors. Uh, and then we do a whole bunch of different sensitivity analysis, including splitting up the sources of growth between uh, existing clients, clients that are very closely embedded among the existing clients, as well as new clients. Uh, and among other things, uh, try to deal with some of the endogeneity concerns, uh, particularly using this uh, OSTA's Delta test. Those of you who have uh, endogeneity concerns in your in your own work might want to look into that a little bit. It's a, it's a really neat test to try and circumscribe the extent to which you need to be concerned about endogeneity in your work. So to conclude, the, the key uh, contribution that I'm really excited about uh, is adding something to our traditional theories of business growth and particularly a demand side perspective to it. Uh, and this idea of thinking about the breadth of added value opportunities uh, seems to be something that could be applied much more broadly than just our paper. Um, and of course, the focal um, motivating uh, research question is also one that we're pretty excited about, uh, trying to understand how relational embeddedness uh, might impact firm growth and particularly thinking about how that might be moderated by other relational attributes. Uh, and I think more generally also this paper advances research uh, on relational strategies thought of at the firm or portfolio level. Uh, I think a lot of our work uh, starting with the, with the idea of the transaction being the unit of analysis has focused very much on dyadic work, but over the last decade or so, we've seen a flowering of work at the portfolio level. Uh, and I think that that's a particularly a useful direction as well. So with that, let me stop. Thank you all. Okay, so I have opened the chat room. Uh, if you have questions uh, or comments, uh, please enter them over there. I have also uh, provided a link uh, to this paper um, that uh, was published online on February 11th. So you can directly download uh, a PDF version if you have access to organization science uh, subscriptions. If uh, you don't, uh, go ahead and get in touch with the authors. All right, let's now move to the second paper. Go right ahead, Zavir, thank you. All right, you can see my slides, uh, Gwen? Yes, yes. All right, thank you, Gwen. Uh, thank you, Navid. Thank you to the entire uh, SDR division for the opportunity to uh, present this research and uh, for keeping uh, our uh, research uh, neurons going uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout the year. Um, I'm glad to pre present this paper, uh, which is co-authored with uh, Mario Scheiben, who is also on this call, if you want to reach out to him via chat or otherwise. Um, and it's a paper about, as the title will say, uh, what happens if we think in terms of uh, levels of analysis a bit differently, in a sense, the way um, already we've seen this done in uh, the presentation uh, that we just had by Deepak. Um, but in this case, maybe a bit more micro than, uh, than most of the research has been done. Our motivation basically is the notion that in uh, the literature, uh, the effect of learning is uh, highly elusive, and uh, whether it's related to capabilities or outright performance. Uh, and following from that, uh, we uh, uh, accept and try and aim to build on a uh, growing uh, explanation for this uh, pattern, or for these uh, conflicting patterns of results in literature, which pertains to the fact that for learning to be effective, it needs to somehow be harnessed um, at the uh, firm level, uh, typically by a corporate entity that's specialized in the type of activity that uh, we're trying to learn from um, and in, a, in a manner that would, uh, in particular, preclude uh, negative transfer effects of the two which I return to. Our take in this paper will be a bit different. Uh, we start with, a, with a, by noticing that the literature in advancing this very powerful and very interesting uh, explanation 
tends to assume uh, that this function is of a corporate nature, or put another way, perhaps that uh, learning is uh, an entity or, or a purpose of the whole organization. Of course, our micro colleagues, including our micro foundations, co colleagues might uh, might take, take offense with that. But as a characterization of the literature, I think it's uh, pretty fair. What happens if we actually start to look at acquisitions, but now honing on at what level the acquisitions occur, by which I mean where the acquisitions are integrated, whether they integrate in particular, whether uh, uh, an acquisition is integrated inside one of the firm's existing beams. Well, the first thing that we do is we get closer to reality uh, in that, uh, and we're not the only ones to find this, the overwhelming majority of acquisitions actually are of this nature. They are not bolted on to uh, the corporation. They don't extend the corporation's scope. They might extend a little bit the scope of a business unit, but overwhelmingly, they grow a business unit. In our case, 95 to 97% of acquisitions are of this nature, and this is, again, consistent with figures from uh, a number of studies. From there, what can we do? Well, now that we have understood where uh, acquisitions get integrated, we can do several things. First, we can disentangle flows and therefore measure experience at the level of a particular business units, the acquisitions that have been integrated in, inside it, and also measure separate flows of experience pertaining to acquisitions that are integrated in other business units of the same parents, I'll refer to them as sister business units. That's an intra-organizational distinction. There's also a corporate dimension, which, will, uh, which I will uh, only allude to briefly today. But we can also more, fine, more finely identify the rivals from which a particular business unit's integration or uh, acquisitions uh, may learn than we would at the corporate level, where evidently we look at a broader portfolio of such. Uh, that allows us to basically theorize about the effect of accessibility and applicability, where in short, accessibility tends to be large within the firm, applicability not necessarily so anymore once we've made these distinctions, and vice versa in uh, the sense of rivals. Uh, there are other benefits that I won't have the chance to get into in detail, but that pertain to essentially at least better dealing better with unreserved urbanity and to a certain extent selection and acquisition, and also being able to separate out the corporate type of acquisition from business level. Um, in the interest of time, I won't sort of belabor uh, what follows, but essentially we can leverage transfer theory by trying to hone in on how accessible and how applicable different flows of experience that directly or vicariously uh, uh, happen around a business unit. In practice, we would argue that uh, as a starting point, that a focal business unit's uh, acquisition experience is both highly accessible, quite evidently, but also highly applicable, of course, not without limitations. Conversely, we believe that in the case of sister business units, there is potential to travel. There tends to be generally high accessibility, in fact, perhaps increased by the type of mechanisms that we uh, discussed uh, at the onset of this presentation. On the other hand, applicability of what would co could work for a business, for, for one business unit within the firm is not guaranteed to carry over to another business unit within, within the firm. So here we have one possibility. Finally, at the level of uh, the, um, of a, of a arrivals, we can assume that there is limited accessibility of the knowledge, but a great amount of similarity, at least in the sense of industrial rivalry and uh, technology to a certain extent that is relevant. We can refine this further by arguing, and this is in line, for instance, with Olivia and Kekelstein's uh, groundbreaking work from back in 1999 and 2002, that this effect of sister BUs, the, the risks pertaining to sister BUs uh, being poor guides for a particular BU is more severe if the sister BUs are less related. And conversely, that the hurdle of accessibility can be overcome via closer proximity in 
the sense of uh, Gilbert and Zander's version of the Nash basin, for instance. In practice, though, this only matters if the firm makes an acquisition, and therefore we're going to operationalize these predictions as interactions. I will skip rather briefly over the research design. The elements that you need to understand is that in order to do so, we need to have essentially the complete, a reasonably complete history of the acquisitions of a corporation um, and break that down at the business unit level. I won't belabor how that's done. This is arguably the major uh, both hurdle and hopefully part of the contribution of this paper, but essentially the ability to identify where each and every one of the acquisitions that appear on a firm's books actually end up in terms of being integrated into one or in some instances, several business units is essentially the crux of solving this and um, making our predictions testable. Uh, I won't belabor the research design that largely uh, centers around uh, experience variables that you're probably very largely familiar with. Um, very briefly, uh, I will uh, 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 go very briefly through this. The first thing that we can notice is that if we take a naive view as opposed to the more refined view that we argue, we find a mild effect of a total acquisition learning, this corporate view that tends to be prominent in the literature. Uh, but uh, that effect is mild in terms of significance, but also in terms of empirical magnitude. If we confront this view with looking at the effect of learning uh, conversely at the business unit level, we find that the latter dominates. And not only does the latter dominate, but our mild positive effect at the business at the, at the corporate level actually turns negative. And this gives us a first clue, of course, that whereas the, the business unit may gain from experience somewhere else in the organization, somewhere else the organization spells, the, gives us the clue to the possible trouble. To look into this further, we can now decompose the total experience of the firm into a particular focal business units experience on one hand, its sister units, business units experience on the other hand, and finally, uh, the corporate level uh, acquisitions that are of a different nature. What we find when we find this, we find that indeed there tends to be a baseline propensity for acquisitions made by sister business units to be poor guides for a particular focal business units on acquisitions. Um, an effect that I'll return to in a moment. We don't find support for our expectation that in general one learns from rivals at the business unit level, but if we leverage the, the data a bit further, we find that to refine this argument, and this is consistent with previous literature, the effect of sister business units is more severe, the, the failure to learn from sister business units is more severe when looked at, at the, um, when, when pertaining to unrelated sister business units. And conversely, the ability to learn and the benefits of, of, uh, uh, that accrue from learning from rivals are stronger in the case of proximate rivals from which it is easier to learn. Uh, briefly stated, in terms of magnitude, as you can see here, uh, the harm that uh, arises from trying to learn, if it does happen at all, from unrelated sister business units uh, can be evidenced here in a way that it to my knowledge has never been previously in the literature. Conversely, the benefits of learning from rival is contingent on co-location. In short, uh, what do we get from this? Uh, first, uh, we can start to get a, a sense of why what we observe uh, uh, to be a net average corporate level positive or negative effects may be explained as a combination of different blends of some positive effects that we attribute primarily in this case to a business unit's um, uh, flow of experience being a good guide to its own uh, future acquisitions and confusion that may arise elsewhere in the organization. Uh, so you know, obviously it follows that organization matters a lot to this phenomena and the distribution of business units as well. That allows us to look at both the positive and the negative sides of experience as pertains to a business unit and to develop specific contingencies pertaining to when and 
ultimately how one may both uh, minimize the downside of a, a potentially overly complex or confused organization uh, within the firm and maximize learning from lives. We're just about at 12, 12 minutes, so I'm going to stop here and just leave you for one final thought as uh, we go through uh, the rest of this presentation. Thank you again. Thank you very much. All right. Now we have our third paper ready for presentation. Take it away, Danny. Great. Thank you again to, uh, to Gwen and Navid. It's, it's great to see uh, so many familiar faces in the SCR community here. Um, really excited to share this, um, this paper that is currently you know, really in the throes of the revision process. And so uh, I have to apologize that I have to leave the session a little bit early to go teach. Um, so I, I won't be, I probably won't be around for the discussion, but I'd love to follow up with uh, folks after the fact. Um, you know, I, I had previously assumed that our paper here, um, a, a really coast-to-coast -coast collaboration with uh, Russ Funk at Minnesota, Marlon Twyman at USC, and then um, Jason Owen Smith and John Hollingsworth at, at Michigan. I, I had um, sort of been a little bit concerned that this would be the ugly duckling or the sort of odd paper out because um, kind of continuing on the trend of drilling deeper, uh, we're going to look, uh, think a little bit about teams. And so even if you're not super familiar with the team's literature, you no doubt have had experience working in teams. And one of the sort of generally accepted um, kind of associations about teams and team familiarity is that the more that teams work together, the better that they perform. Um, and so generally, uh, this is positively correlated with performance. And, you know, particularly in the context of uh, surgical procedures, which is the, the setting of our study, it's linked to operational efficiency and better outcomes. So not only are there uh, studies in our literature pertaining to this research context, in surgical journals and medical journals, there are similar um, studies that sort of show this positive correlation that if you keep a team together, they're more likely to uh, perform better, be more efficient, have better outcomes for patients, reduce costs, et cetera. Um, and so because of that, many organizations believe that teams that have more experience together will perform better. And uh, this is certainly true at the organization that I worked at prior to um, attending grad school. And so uh, in fact, uh, at that hospital, Brigham and Women's in Boston, um, there was actually a, a quite well-known surgeon, Atul Gawande, who published a piece in the New Yorker uh, several years ago uh, highlighting this very fact, comparing surgery uh, or uh, surgery, at least at our hospital, to the Cheesecake Factory in some instances. Um, but so the question is, you know, is team familiar always beneficial? And you know, we have tons of research that suggests that, you know, there are various reasons why familiarity is good. Um, and then, the, you know, there are some limitations of familiarity, and these are your sort of well-trod uh, limitations of embeddedness or over-embeddedness the isolation, the sort of tunnel vision or the parochial view that may sort of come to dominate over seeing the, the forest for the trees. Uh, so th this is sort of well understood. The sort of, uh, the main argument of our paper though is, and, and in tying back to the theme of today, uh, is, is to think more about, okay, so what does this mean for the organizational structure and organizational design? Um, so in the sense of, if we're thinking about teams being embedded in organizations, that the teams do not form outside of the context of organizations usually, I mean, at least not in the cases that we often study, um, and that these teams are also building blocks of the larger whole organizational network. So when teams are forming, the previous ties of the individuals that comprise the new team, they're not lost. There, there's that history, that shared experience, which we know, and nor are these new ties formed in a vacuum. So it's not as if you suddenly isolate this team from the rest of the organization, they're still working in that, that setting. And so each team is potentially adding new ties to the whole network. And this is particularly important in context where you see sort of this crew-based model where you have different experts or different professionals that fulfill different roles. And so surgery is a great one, but also flight crews, consulting teams, even you know, co-author relationships where we're, we're trying to to identify the people that we think 
one, have the capacity to do this, but also are best suited for the, the particular work. And so that's, that's generally the premise here. So what happens if we think about team familiarity, that link to performance, and the fact that each of these teams is going to be embedded in and in sort of is affected by the organizational network, but also may affect the, the network as a whole. And so really the fairly simple question is, how do the effects of team familiarity change when we consider this interplay between team and organization? So um, the context here is coronary artery bypass graft surgery. So this is a, a major uh, heart surgery, but despite it being major, this is sort of routinely scheduled. There's a high volume of these procedures done on an annual basis in the US. Uh, and so we're looking at US Medicare beneficiaries who uh, underwent this procedure, uh, so this acronym is uh, acutely pronounced CABBAGE, uh, between January 1, 2008 and December 31, 2011. This, is a comprise, this is comprises about 182,000 cases. Um, so each observation that we look at then is going to be at the, at the individual patient or case level. And this one, this, each observation will then be associated with the treating hospital, the organization, and then the treating care team. Which, it, which comprises physicians who are seeing this patient uh, going 30 days back before the date of surgery into that preoperative period, and then 60 days postoperatively following the date of surgery to encompass that follow-up care. Um, and then so for each observation, there is this hospital network context. We're gonna look at as our primary outcome variables, things that are very important um, for our you know, health services and healthcare management colleagues. Uh, total cost of surgery, as well as 60-day readmissions. Uh, obviously, both of these you want to keep low. And the, we, we're looking at care team network clustering, as well as in order to characterize the context in which these, these team-based procedures are taking place, the average team clustering of the hospital. And so let me explain a little bit further what, what, we're, what we're talking about. Um, and for, for reference, these are publicly available, though behind the paywall data from uh, the US government. And so these are the, the primary data sets uh, that are being used here. And this is the uh, website that you can look at if you're uh, curious about this data. So the network construction is, is based on patient sharing. So this is sort of a well-established now uh, way to look at provider networks and the movement of patients within healthcare systems. Uh, so physicians in this case are uh, are tied together if they treat the same patient within this window that we're looking at. And so again, we're focusing on network clustering here. Essentially, are my connections also connected to each other's? And, and so for, from the team perspective, the higher the network clustering is, the more we assume that they're familiar because they're, you know, they're more densely connected within, within that team. Um, and importantly here, to try to, to get at the, the sort of interplay that we're, we're interested in, we construct the network for each team. So each observation now has a team network, but then because we know the date of surgery and we have a history of all of the other surgeries that have happened in each organization, we look at the year prior to that, that particular case, we construct the all of the other teams, uh, team networks that have happened up until that time. And we take the average level of clustering of each of those teams for the previous year to sort of characterize the context in which the focal observations uh, surgery is taking place. And so that, that in that way, we're, we're looking at, so if you imagine a, a, new, a patient comes in, they're getting surgery, a new team is assembled from the organization for that case. And now we're, we want to understand how does the the sort of larger context around that case uh, interact with, with what's going on um, for that individual team. Uh, our primary analysis here, uh, we're gonna show some preliminary results. Uh, OLS with uh, fixed effects at various levels. So at the year, the quarter, the organization, and then for the operating surgeon. Uh, Cause again, we're looking at uh, outcomes related to surgery. So costs and, and uh, patient uh, readmissions. So this is a sort of marginal effects plot of our, our main results. And I wanna sort of walk you through this because it's a, little bit, uh, it's a little bit confusing at first. 
what I want to draw your attention, so as we're going left to right along the, the x-axis here, the clustering of the individual team that is performing the surgery is increasing. So the, the level of familiarity is increasing from left to right. Each line then is meant to represent different organizational contexts um, based on the average uh, team familiarity of the other teams. So first, let's look at this line right here that is relatively flat. So this is looking at the 10th percentile. So when, when we have an organization in which most of the teams have very low familiarity, what we're seeing is that there doesn't seem to be that much of an effect of increasing the familiarity of the team. And so, and, and you know, contrast that with the other lines here where as the familiarity around the focal team is increasing, then we're starting to see more of this traditional relationship where as we go uh, left to right, we see this increase in performance. So lower on the Y is better, familiarity generally is good. And so on one hand, you know, we might interpret this as being, okay, in certain contexts, maybe there's less return on familiarity. On the other hand, does this suggest that perhaps in certain contexts, these organizational networks, the teams performing in these contexts are more consistent or more resilient? And so it's important to note here that the magnitude of difference, let's say here at the far end of the, the x-axis, is not that large. And so you know, we have this perception maybe that uh, organizational familiarity or having more uh, consistent teams within the organization would be better overall, but maybe it's not, not that much better. You know, maybe it's not as good as we thought. And so... We, we try to look at this in a couple of different other settings. So if we look at just urgent and emergent cases, we're seeing a very similar effect here. Perhaps there's a little bit more benefit for familiarity overall. But the, the conceit here is that if these teams are coming together even more quickly for these emergent cases and you don't have the ability to plan ahead, you know, potentially they're more random uh, and there's a higher probability that they're going to be less, um, less familiar. But we're seeing consistent effects. Uh, as well as if we look at another surgical procedure, uh, prostatectomy. So similar to cabbage in that it is routinely scheduled ahead of time, uh, but we still see a similar sort of result that as we go, um, as the overall organizational familiarity increases, we start to see uh, this sort of classical or expected result of team familiarity, but in other settings, maybe not as much. And so, uh, you know, what are the takeaways? How do we interpret these? And, you know, what should you remember from this? So we think that it's really important to note here that organizations that do believe in these sorts of things, that um, if we promote team familiarity and try to keep teams stable, um, yes, this is probably likely going to be beneficial for the team, especially when it comes to work that is fairly routine or repetitive. Um, that, that's, that makes sense. But these policies and these sort of organizational changes that are in place, these aren't costless procedures. I mean, just the very, uh, this mundane example of surgical teams and the scheduling that's involved in many organizations, that's a manual time intensive process. And so their effectiveness, the effectiveness of trying to implement these policies can actually be reduced or potentially even net negative in certain contexts. Um, and these contexts as well are, are kind of going to be reflexively affected by changes to the team structure. So there is this con complex interplay between what happens to the team, how you change the team, and what that means for the organization as a whole. And so because the team is not operating in isolation, the policies that affect teams may ultimately affect the organization as a whole. And basically, we may be spinning our wheels trying to do a lot of things uh, with the intent of doing better and really not accomplishing much at all. Uh, and so, you know, for us is that research on these structural and relational attributes of teams and organizational structures or networks uh, should try to account more for these complex interactions or these, uh, these interplays that exist between teams and then, you know, the team to the organization. All right. And I think um, we are pretty close to time. That's all I've got. Thank Excellent. You. Thank you so much, Denny. Wow, a lot of very, really cool comparisons. I didn't see uh, the prostate uh, surgeries being compared uh, as a, a sharp contrast. That's really nice. Thank
Thank you. Thank and you. I know you're taking time from your prep uh, before teaching. So if I don't get to see you, uh, I will follow up with you later. Thank you. All right, fourth paper. Take it away. David. All right, so can you see my screen, Gwen? All right, so um, yeah, this here is my paper, the last one. So um, the paper is titled Walls to Unite, How Does Competition in a Firm's Alliance Portfolio Affect the Structure and Outcome of Its Knowledge Production? Here's a paper co-authored with Deepak Nayak, Ram Ranganathan, and Vivek Tandon, my co-authors who are also present here. So we are at the very early phases of developing this paper, so your comments will be immensely helpful. So as you know, firms form portfolios of alliances to share resources with their partners and bolster their innovation. And portfolio members who are competitors are particularly desirable because they afford the focal firm several benefits, including combinatorial opportunities among partners with overlapping resources. And these benefits, of course, rest on the assumption that knowledge within the focal firm can flow without much friction. However, portfolio partners view competition across the portfolio with suspicion because the focal firm can be a gateway for the partner's knowledge leakage to the partner's competitors. So in an SMJ paper in 2018, my co-authors and I showed that knowledge leakage concerns may lead to alliance instability and premature termination. Therefore, partners may require focal firm to implement safeguards to address these concerns. So there is a tension, of course, between how the focal firm views competition in its portfolio and how the partners perceive competition. Therefore, in this paper, we try to answer the following research question. What are the implications of this tension for the production of innovation in terms of processes and in terms of outcomes? So we have two hypotheses. Uh, I'm gonna first show you the hypothesis and go through the, uh, the, the mechanisms. So the first is that first we suggest that because generation of relational rents requires inter-firm relational specific assets, particularly human resources, focal firms employees are likely to be privy to partners know-how and technology in order to protect partners interests. Uh, in order to protect part, uh, partners' interests, the, the focal firm may adopt a policy, which is often known as firewall in investment banking and in technology firms, where employees are compartmentalized in segregated groups. This policy would manifest uh, in inventor network being characterized by pockets of inventors who collaborate more among themselves than they do with inventors outside their group. Therefore, our first hypothesis states that competition among portfolio partners leads to greater clustering, uh, greater segregation in the focal firm's inventor network. So while this action might, might alleviate partners' concerns about loss of their know-how, it comes at a cost. It may undermine focal firm's combinative capabilities by restricting knowledge flow and increasing duplication of efforts. So our second hypothesis states that the greater the segregation in the focal firm's inventor network, the lower its inventive output. So our empirical context, we tested the hypothesis on a sample of US public firms between 1996 and 2017. Uh, we are focusing on two industries, pharmaceutical industry and semiconductor industry because of different levels of knowledge decomposability and different levels of product modularity. The data for uh, the firms and their alliances come from STC, patents and inventors from patents view and competition it comes from 10k forms business segments and I'll explain to you how competition is measured. 
So there are essentially two equations. One is that we have the regress segregation on portfolios competition, and we have a fixed effect specification. For the second hypothesis, we use segregation as an independent variable, and then we have the, the inventive output as a dependent variable. So segregation is measured using normalized entropy and transitivity. And I saw that Denny used transitivity. So uh, he called it clustering, another name is transitivity. So this is an example of nectar biotro uh, bio uh, biotherapeutics uh, network, internal network of inventors in 2004 and in 2005. So in 2004, transitivity and normalized entropy were about 0.54. However, they increased. Segregation increased in the network of inventors. And when we looked at the data, we realized that competition increased by 10% from 2004 to 2005. So how about competition? How did we measure competition? Competition is me measured using textual analysis of partners 10K forms business section. So if you ever look at, you can download the 10K forms, download the 10K forms uh, of different companies, public companies. This is, for example, for Celgene in recent years, and is a very detailed description in the business section. This is the first item in every 10K form. You will see a very detailed description of their products and what they do. So if you look at, if you look at, if you compare the text, uh, the text of the 10 case of two firms, the closer they are in terms of angular distance, you will see that they are more likely that their, their businesses overlap more and therefore they are more likely to be competitors and the greater is their extent of competition. However, if you think about competition in the portfolio, it comes from two sources. One is that you have a new partner being added to the portfolio and therefore its business overlaps with other partners. And this is probably partly driven by firm strategy in including what partner include, whether the firm wants to include partners in the portfolio or not. Another is that you have, for example, in a specific year, you have three partners and now they decide, they start competing in a different way. They start, uh, you know, they do business in a different way and their business description in their 10 case changes. And now uh, two partners, two partners become competitors in the portfolio just because their business changed. So we measured average competition across the portfolio due to change in the current partner's competitive profile rather just change in the composition of the network. And in that way, we can deal partially with the problem of endogeneity. So if you look at our results, and again, this is very pre preliminary result. So we find support for our first hypothesis that uh, competition, competition leads to more segregation measured by transitivity and normalized entropy. However, we don't find results for the semiconductor industry. Um, the, while this is very a preliminary result, we find this interesting because um, product modularity and knowledge decomposability are very different across these two industries. So in terms of our second hypothesis, where we say that the greater the segregation in the focal firm's inventor network, the lower its inventive output, we see that both transitivity and normalized entropy, they undermine innovation measured in different ways. We measured it by number of patents applied, forward citation, number of patents with above average citation, and number of high impact patents, which would be number of patents with above average citation plus one SD. So they are even more high impact. And this is for the pharma subsample. So if we go to the, uh, if you go to the semiconductor subsample, we see a similar, a similar effect. So we are thinking about the future direction of this research and how we can extend it. Um, there are some papers we are working on. So first of all, what are the network architectures? Of course, we have segregation, but are there network architectures where, where gatekeepers inside the organization can vet costs and benefits of intra-firm collaboration? and therefore selectively shares information across groups 
so that they can contain competition, the side effects of competition, but at the same time, maintain the combinative capabilities of the firm. And the other is that currently we are looking at this exogenous portfolio competition and how it impacts internal collaboration architecture, right? And now the other step is to think about internal collaboration architecture and how it impacts the choices of firms in forming its portfolio, whether the firm wants to have competitor in its portfolio or not. And of course, we can think about organizational restructuring, major and acquisitions, and cooperative strategies in this context. And that's for my presentation. Thanks for paying attention. Thank you. Thank you, David. So now we have uh, completed the four paper presentations, and we would like to invite the two discussants. And I believe Nadini will go first. Hi Gwen, uh, thanks so much everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Perfect, it's wonderful to see so many familiar faces and I want to thank the STR division. I want to thank Gwen and Navid for uh, putting together an exceptional set of papers. Congratulations to all the presenters, very thought provoking ideas. Um, I know we are already at 9.01 about Pacific Standard Time, so 29 minutes left in the session. And I do want to leave time for my co-discussant, Julia, good to see you, and uh, for questions from the audience. So I will keep this brief. Uh, so I have um, two papers, uh, the first two, uh, John Mosley and uh, Deepak Somaya's work, uh, followed by Javier Martin's uh, work as well. So these are two very different papers in, 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 the, in, in the sense uh, that, you know, as we know, John and Deepak's paper is already forthcoming in organization science. So it's gone through the review process. It's presumably, you know, went through the painful multi-revision process, typical of a top tier publication. So it's, at a, you know, a definitely a very different stage. Uh, Javier's paper um, is at a different stage, very interesting paper, very interesting preliminary findings. But my role as a discussant is going to reflect the different stages these papers are at. So I'll start with John and Deepak's paper. And given it's already published or you know has been published online, I'm going to really reflect on what next. Okay, what do we learn from your research? And I must confess here I have a deep personal interest in <laughs> Deepak's work. Um, I had the honor of accepting his paper at AMJ very early on as an associate editor, the 2008 AMJ paper. I'll talk briefly about that and the stream of research there. Um, I'm also very familiar with John and Deepak's 2018 um, SMJ paper. And I think this current paper is a very nice complement to that. Um, so congratulations on the forthcoming publication. Your theory is well articulated. The hypotheses are logical, a strong construct validity. And I want to note that your paper is indeed a very strong complement to your 2018 paper, John and Deepak, where you focused on the opportunities or influences stemming from a firm's existing uh, customers. And there you showed that when the level of relational assets uh, shared between a supplier and a client is higher, then the supplier is more likely to capture uh, additional business from that client. And so that paper clearly demonstrated the benefits of strong relationships with existing clients. Interestingly, in this paper, you're showing us the dark side, right? How does capturing relationships with existing clients result in a trade-off when it comes to Bravo, right? The breadth of value added relationships. And so you're going to the dark side of those strong relationships by examining how these affect the relationships of the supplier with potential other clients, and hence their ability to broaden their portfolio and grow. Now, I will start with three uh, broad directions for future research for your consideration. And I will, of course, send you my more detailed Word document, um, which elaborates on some of these. So number one, um, I have always been intrigued from my early days as a consultant on the role knowledge intensive firms play in transmitting proprietary knowledge, either consciously or unconsciously. What does that mean? What is the source of competitive advantage for these firms when they file patents, right? So if patent prosecutions reflect proprietary intellectual property, then when a consulting firm or a law firm 
co-creates value with the client, is there an implicit understanding that this co-created value will not be transmitted to rivals in the, in the, in the firm's um, broader industry? So I wonder if in your definition of relational embeddedness and the commitment contracts that you may have access to, whether you might be able to tease out exclusivity provisions or non-compete clauses to see how this potential dissipation of competitive advantage acts to deter further client expansion of client growth. So that's one, one thing that I have been very intrigued by as a strategy scholar is as a consultant, I want to leverage deep knowledge, but I also want to be able to leverage that knowledge so that next time I have a new client, I don't want to go down the learning curve again, right? I just want to take what I learned here and minimize reinventing the, the wheel and go down the learning curve very quickly. So that's my first, uh, first broad research question. Second, um, in your limitations, you, you acknowledge that suppliers are relationally embedded with buyers can experience less growth and yet be more profitable. Now, I would argue this is not really a limitation, right? I mean, you have to write some limitations for a very strong paper, but I really see this more as a direction for future research because what you're really saying is, look, there are advantages to a go deep as opposed to a go broad strategy. In strategy, we've often looked at value creation and value capture. And this paper really focuses on the value creation, right? Your Bravo, your um, breadth of uh, volume is really focusing on the value creation aspect. But we know from, from a lot of research that not all the value you create is captured by the supplier. So I think there's great potential for you to look at what are the trade-offs. For example, if you look at it from a value capture angle, Maybe up to a point, client diversification increases value creation and value capture. But after the inflection point, your ability to capture value goes down, perhaps because you're just sharing old knowledge, right? Or the new client really doesn't want to trust you with proprietary knowledge. So that's another area where I think you can, you can extend your research. Um, going back to the 2008 AMJ paper, I think it would be very intriguing if you could examine the interplay between patent attorney turnover and relational factors. In your 2000 AMJ paper, you found that the movement of employees from the supplier firms uh, to and from clients increases firm performance. And I wonder how the movement of your, your attorneys to and from client firms acts in the context of a portfolio of clients, right? So in-house concurrent sourcing and buyer-specific knowledge, how are they affected through this patent, through patent attorney flows? Um, and I think that's some very interesting work that you can do in that area. Um, and then the last point I wanna make is uh, with findings that you actually didn't discuss in the paper, or maybe you did I, and I missed it, they were not hypothesized, but they jumped out at me. Tables three, four, and five all show very strong main effects for in-house concurrent sourcing and bio-specific knowledge. These are very robust findings. So on the demand side, you have strong main negative effects of buyer side variables, demand side variables, and their effect on growth. And I think this tells you a compelling story that perhaps the supplier side variables, cross servicing ability and buyer's relational commitment are perhaps not as powerful as the demand side attributes. There might be some further research there. You can definitely look at the main effects of demand side variables. And so in conclusion, I, you know, I certainly enjoyed reading this paper and your prior work. And I look forward to your next paper in this research stream. Uh, excellent presentation and great work. Thank you, Deepak, and uh, thank you, John. Gwen, do you uh, take questions for this uh, paper now, or do you want me um, to go on? I think in the interest of time, let's proceed with your comments uh, for uh, the next paper. Um, I will take all the questions through the chat and then put them all together at the end okay. after Fair Julia's enough. presentation. Fair enough. Thank you so much. Um, uh, so the second paper is uh, for Mario, Shaivin, and Xavier. Um, and I, in the spirit of what I said earlier, um, I will put on the hat of a critical reviewer because I think that's what you would gain the most uh, at, this, at this stage, right? Um, first of all, let me commend you on some great data uh, and the rigorous process you followed to ensure that you are indeed looking at BU acquisitions that are integrated into the business units. I think that's, that's a terrific angle. There's a lot of novelty in that. And I also agree that we need to look at business unit learning and the effects of such learning um, on the business unit performance. 
Um, for your consideration, as you move this paper, you know, to the next stage and hopefully to journal submission, I'm going to highlight three, three major uh, questions, concerns for you to think about. Number one is the overall motivation and framing of your contribution. Uh, you said this in the presentation, also in the paper, that prior literature assumes that the firm's experience base is monotonic and learning occurs at the firm as a whole while your contribution lies in distinguishing learning at the BU level and differentiating it from the overall firm level. Now, while this may be true of studies that have looked at corporate acquisitions and diversified firms, I wonder if you might be able to justify this assumption is also true for many acquisition studies that have looked at single unit firms or have looked at firms within industries. For example, uh, there's a whole stream of research from Anne Miner and her colleagues that I'm sure you're, you know, you're aware of. Uh, for example, there's a 1997 AMJ paper, uh, J. Kim and Anne Miner, uh, that specifically invokes accessibility and applicability arguments uh, similar to what you do. And they find that vicarious learning from other organizations depends on the geographic market and industry origin, right? So I would urge you to go deeper into that literature. I, I realize this is a short presentation. You probably have all those citations, but I think one of the pushbacks you may get is how tenable really is this assumption, right? Are you creating a straw man here? So that's, that's one, one point. The second point I wanna make is um, in terms of the hypothesis, the one that I found very interesting was 2A and 2B, because I think that's really the crux of your novel theoretical and empirical contribution, okay? So if you think about H1, there's already a lot of research showing that the likelihood of an acquisition is positively associated with the prior experience of the focal firm, the acquisition performance of the focal firm and their interaction, okay? Now this raises an interesting empirical challenge for you. To really test H1, I think you will need to take a step back and first model the likelihood that the focal BU makes an acquisition, okay? Think of it as a selection model, right? So you will need to first show what is the likelihood that the focal BU has made an acquisition. Then in a second stage model, you can tease out the moderating effects that you have currently as H1, okay? So that's something I want you to think about is, and you also note this, you say in your paper, H1, 2A and 3A can be thought of as effects of the respective types of experience given that a current acquisition occurred. But instead of just saying that, I think you actually need to empirically tease it out. Okay. Um, the other major concern I have empirically is, are you really, can you defend operating margins as the right dependent variable? Okay. Uh, and, and, you know, Mario, you have written quite extensively on acquisitions and Javier, you know this very well. There's a reason why most prior work look at you know, except returns around the event of acquisition, because that's probably the only way to link performance of a acquisition to that acquisition itself, right? But when you go to operating margins, you now have a whole host of other confounding factors. And even though you control for the firm level effects, you probably would need to think about at the BU level, what are the other confounding effects on operating margins? So I would urge you to go back into perhaps your data and see if you can find a more proximate uh, dependent variable. Now, H2A and DUPI, as I said, are really, from my point of view, the most interesting. But I think here you will need to go deeper into the causal mechanisms. What's really going on here? For example, you argue, I think, that uh, the findings from H2B, that unrelated BU experience has a negative effect, is perhaps because of inappropriate transfer of learning. But there may be something else going on, which is resource trade-offs at the corporate level. What if at the corporate level, the resources that the sister units are getting is a function of some kind of a trade-off that's taking place. So this focal unit is not getting the resources it needs. Okay? And again, you have great data. I think you can go deeper into that. And in the interest of time, I will keep this you know, um, very focused, but I think H3A and 3B are perhaps theoretically the cleanest hypothesis. You know, I, didn't, you know, I don't have much quibbles with them, but they're not actually very novel, right? Because as I said earlier, there's a lot of research on geographic proximity, approximate industries and similarity and so on. So again, I would, I would really urge you to 
frame and motivate this in terms of the prior literature a little deeper. Uh, have a selection model so you can argue that this is really what's going on. And most important, I would urge you, given the exceptional data you have, it's just fantastic data you have, go deeper into H2A and 2B because that is a relatively unexplored question in the broader acquisition literature. And I will send you my detailed comments and really exceptional piece of work. And thanks for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Nandini. Uh, so there are several papers that Nandini mentioned. I have put them in the chat room uh, just in case the audience would like to refer to them. All right, Julia, please. Okay, um, let's see how. Yes, I can see your beautiful picture. Can you see my screen now? Yes, I can. Okay, so first of all, thank you so much um, to the strategy division, to Navid and Gwendolyn for organizing this and to the, all the presenters for really interesting presentations. So Navid asked me to share some thoughts about his own paper and Danny's project and both were so kind to share um, some extended abstracts with me. And let me say that I really enjoyed reading both of them and I learned a lot. And so thank you so much for sharing. I'll start with Denny's project first. So Denny and his colleagues asked what I think is a really interesting question. So we know that familiarity or co-specialization or learning in teams affects team performance positively. But what about the other teams in the same organization? So how does familiarity within a team and in the, team, in the teams in the same organization affect the faculty performance? Because in a hospital or in any other organization for that matter, Teams don't exist in isolation, right? They're embedded in a whole set of teams around them. So one constraint that one certainly faces when studying such a question is the data access. And Denny solves this beautifully together with his colleagues with a really impressive data set. And they find that team familiarity improves outcomes and interestingly, teams perform even better if the teams around them also show a high degree of familiarity with each other. So I had a take on a finding. Basically, I read this with a certain lens. Familiarity um, may offer an alternative to formal coordination efforts to avoid coordination failures. So for example, prior research has shown that shared experience and shared culture, inter-organizational mobility of people can be a means to improve coordination. And what do I mean when I say coordination? That's the activities of the physicians the more they work with each other allows them to align their actions and then act as if they can predict each other's actions. Because if we look at the measure of outcomes in this work, um, what are approaches to measure coordination outcomes? Well, when something is done more efficiently, more timely, less costly, or in a better quality, right? Um, so this is actually what this project is showing us. Familiarity facilitates coordination, so the surgeries cost less, the patient doesn't have to come back. The other take um, is that individuals in the teams form context-specific skills and human capital that's specific to the group of people they work with. So basically, what we're learning in that, uh, in that language is that units with context-specific skills perform even better when embedded in organizations with other units with context-specific skills. So this could work, um, speak to the work on human capital specificity. So I would, I would briefly uh, touch on two things. First of all, uh, the mechanisms, so familiarity in organizations amplifies positive effects of team familiarity. Now, why would this be the case? Is it that focal teams somehow depend on the routines of teams around them? Or is it that there's spillovers from the other teams that the teams are better able to implement when they're also familiar with each other? And the next point were some thoughts that actually Denny just shared during the presentation with us about the costs of familiarity. Um, because what does the main finding mean ultimately? Should hospitals and organizations in general really just make sure that all teams are as familiar as possible with each other? Probably not, right? Because in a way, um, familiarity for individuals across a team 
It means um, it's the outcome of a continuous absence of continuous change of reconfiguration or recombining people's skills and knowledge. And that could lead to siloing um, uh, and ultimately could mean that the hospital or the organization may get less innovative. So slower at adapting to changes to new technology or slower at discarding uh, practices that are maybe outdated. So perhaps there are cases in the empirics that they could be looking at where physicians needed to quickly shift gears, use a new different method than they anticipated. And this uh, could actually guide us and perhaps offer an extension of this work, not for this particular paper, but for future projects. What's the uh, perfect mix of familiar versus unfamiliar teams in an organization? Perhaps, you know, uh, having one unfamiliar team in an organization is sufficient to adopt new technology and in a way to approach this tension, both being quick to adapt while at the same time being efficient and coordinating well in the familiar teams. And then my last thought was, are familiar teams getting really good at doing surgery on people that don't need it as urgently? And this leads me to perhaps not, not a concern, but a thought on the empirics in the paper. Are people that are, from, that are in familiar teams, that are treated in familiar teams, are they going through surgery? Uh, are they different from the patients in, that are treated in unfamiliar teams? What if the familiar teams are just getting really comfortable with a procedure and conduct surgeries that are more successful because they were less necessary in the first place? And this might be part of the analysis that Danny and his team have conducted already, but something to alleviate concerns like this could be by showing that the patients are very similar along observable characteristics or balancing samples with some type of matching um, approaches, because it's my understanding that in this very rich data set, they do have this um, data. And another point was to control for other sources of specificity, because it seems like familiarity is the specificity that stems from the ties with others. So to really understand familiarity and the specific, uh, specificity in the ties with other physicians, we would need to disentangle all other type of experience and education that physicians have. And as a last comment, I am always really excited about this type of work and so curious how it would play out if we looked at alliances or mergers and acquisitions across hospitals and how these patterns might change. Um, so hopefully I get a chance to speak with him offline about this at some point. Um, so let me get to Navid's paper that he just presented to us. Thank you so much, Navid, for this really interesting um, presentation. So in this um, paper, we ask, how do alliances affect firm structure of the alliance partners contingent on the competition that's present in the alliance portfolio? And then how does that change in the structure um, uh, affect innovation outcome? And what they find is really interesting, right? Firms will tend to form clusters in their inventor networks if there's competition among the alliance portfolio partners. So in other words, they're sort of seeking to build up some firm hurdles to lock away or block knowledge from being dispersed within the firm and then potentially towards their alliance partners, right? And in turn, this reconfiguration into clusters that accompanies the alliance may negatively affect innovation outcome. And that's perhaps why the alliance was formed in the first place. So that's not good. So the first thought that I had when reading your paper, and I mean, it led me to um, thinking what exactly is the distinction between restructuring and reconfiguration? And maybe this is not that essential, but it was uh, sort of to feed my own curiosity. So restructuring seems to be the changing of how resources are grouped and then coordination amongst these groupings. And reconfiguration is the adding, divesting, recombining of resources, so shifting around and changing and combination of stuff in the firm. But it seems more like tweaking while the first seems more disruptive and formal. But this is actually an open question that I have maybe to the crowd. What is it that the paper really looks at? And perhaps we can touch upon this in the discussion. Um, my first sense was that the clustering measures gets more closely at reconfiguration or recombination. Um, and the second thought uh, your work led me to was there's a large stream of um, literature on the resource and business unit reconfiguration and recombination that follows mergers and acquisitions in the post-merge integration process. 
But what you're looking at um, can be seen as the reconfiguration of resources in the post-alliance process. So the process after an alliance as the other mode of external uh, reconfiguration and adding to the resource base of the focal firm. So with that in mind, I had read, or we can read the findings of your paper as alliances are accompanied by internal reconfiguration of human capital into clusters. And that means a decrease in potential recombinations of human capital that ultimately um, hinders innovative outcomes. But I'd be happy to talk more about this off offline as well, of course. I just had a few quick notes on the empirics, because if I got this right, you identify the competition in the alliance portfolio by looking at whether the alliance partner has competitors in the portfolio, right? And I don't have a good enough understanding practically how alliances come about, but um, alliance partners may be able to decide who they partner with contingent on who they partner with already. So why am I saying this? Because uh, that can take us to an alternative story, and maybe that's credible to some as well. Firms that don't have clusters are maybe the better firms, and they might only want to partner with firms that uh, haven't already partnered with their competitors. And then these could also be the firms that are more innovative. Um, maybe there are also some sort of balancing approaches in your, in your data set that could alleviate some of this. And a small comment was also that um, at least for H2, you might benefit from including M&A activity as a control just because it's the other mode that also has uh, internal reconfiguration as a result. So just to summarize really quickly, um, my take on both the papers was I was reading them in the opposite direction. So really I was reading it as like digging down deeper and deeper into this external modes of reconfiguration, how they're accompanied by internal reconfiguration and then within within structures when looking at teams. And I do think that this uh, drilling down and looking at these multiple levels might allow us to get a, a tensions between reaping synergies, coordination, familiarity, being efficient, but maybe also rigid, and then continuous combination at the same time, if we consider that these things can happen at different levels of observations and not at the firm level, which is also what Xavier was saying in his paper as well. So the use of big data, I think, and this interdisciplinary collaborations, as we thought with Denny's paper, especially in the healthcare sector, seem a really promising path forward in pursuing this type of work, but also sim simulation could help us to gain more insight. So that's it for me as well. Thank you so much for your attention and I look forward to the discussion. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Julia. Wonderful, wonderful comments. Very helpful to the authors, definitely. And uh, now we're going to uh, open with the remaining two minutes uh, for any Q&A. Uh, if you have some feedback for Denny, you can put it in the chat room. I promise I will relay that to him. Uh, and if you want to raise your questions directly without doing the chat, you can do that by waving your hands. I'm going to be looking through your videos very quickly in case you are raising hands. Okay. Um, so far, I have not uh, seen questions or comments directly to the set of papers. All right. Okay. All right. So we have uh, reached, uh, oh, actually, uh, Ray Wong. Wong, would you like to go ahead and ask you a question? Um, that's the only question I'll take today. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, I, I want just a very minor question about the textual analysis on 10K to measure the competitive, the, the level of compet competition. So I was wondering uh, if you use the role test of the management uh, business, that section, or you have done some pre-processing on that, like you can extract some known phrase or product name or things like that, or if you just use the cosine or things like that, similarity, compare the row test. So that's one confusion I have in my mind. Thank you. 
So your question is, so the common words are removed from the text, okay? So like things like verbs and common words and pronouns, they are all taken away from the, from the text. And then uh, we use similarity measure of the vectors of the phrases in the, in the text. I don't know whether that answers your question. Yes, so you use cosine similarity to yes. compare just the uh, uh, cleaning some yes. common words. Or, okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ray, for the question. All right, so we have reached uh, to our final uh, ending time. Again, uh, thank you so much for your participation. And we have several more STR events. Uh, please uh, do check out our website and stay, continue to be uh, involved and engaged. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Gwen. Thanks, Bye. -bye. Take care. Thank you, Gwen. Uh, Gwen and then Navi. Thank you so much. Thank you, Yulia. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.